Hi, everyone. Welcome to What's New in MPMI, the virtual seminar series of the MPMI Journal. While everyone's logging on, we're waiting for everyone to get in the virtual room. Um, please type into the chat where you are coming from. And I see people are already Sridhar Vanganathan from Chennai, India. Who else is here? Um, Brian from uh, Georgia. Valdir Junovas Morera from Brazil. Uh, Claudia Martinez from Mexico. Salam from Pakistan. Emilia Lopez from Madrid. Um, Lindsay from Washington State. Um, John Bennett from USDA West Virginia. Virginia. Alexander McClellan from the UK. And uh, starting to go a little fast, Arkansas, Florida. Um, Alexandra from Ottawa, um, North Carolina, Valparaiso, Chile. So we've got people coming in from all around the world. Um, please keep adding those there. It's always fun to see where everyone's from. Welcome. Um, what's new in MPMI? Um, if you're just joining in, this is What's New in MPMI, our virtual seminar series. I'm Jean Harris. I'm the host and organizer. And as you can see, we are a very international society, and this is a chance for us to engage with people around the world. It's one of the real bonuses of suddenly realizing we could do everything virtually. So, um, so welcome. And the other one of the other goals here is to increase inclusion. So everybody, um, this is free. Everybody has a chance to ask a question at the end. Just type your question into the Q and A box at the bottom. And I will go through and read them uh, once we get to the, to the end of the presentation. And you can always come back and watch the recording, which will also be free and will be posted um, permanently available. Um, you can get to it by getting to the same red, uh, website where you registered. And we hope to have an edited transcript to go along with it to improve accessibility. So if you would like to volunteer to edit the transcript from today's presentation, it's really helpful to have someone who understands the science to be able to make all those little changes. Uh, Zoom puts together most of the transcript and we just need someone to correct the names and the scientific words. So if you're interested, please type into the chat and we will get in touch with you. Um, okay, yes, and um, Karen, who is our wonderful support person here, will be posting the recording, hopefully pretty soon, um, certainly by tomorrow. And you can see the link where you can find it there. And that's also where you, well, we're gonna take a little break for summer, for our Northern Hemisphere summer, and come back with another seminar in September. So you can come back and see um, what's been scheduled. We don't have anybody up there for now, but we will. Okay, so, I'm very excited about today's seminar. It was a paper that I saw right when it came in um, as first look, it's being very interesting. And it's a good, it's, well, I don't wanna to give too much away, but let's just say there's a lot of different pieces here. There's proteomics, there's wild potato, uh, and all of this thinking about it from within the context, not just of plant pathology, but of, really agriculture and farmers, what happens when we grow potatoes here and how can we grow them in a more healthy way um, for them and for us. And this whole diversity of wild plants and uh, the wild relatives of all of our crop plants and what they have, uh, they still retain and what they might bring to the table as it were, is a really interesting story. And I'm excited to have the whole set of collaborators here today. As you know, science, modern science, is more and more collaborative. And to be able to ask these interdisciplinary questions, you need people with different kinds of expertise. So I'm going to um, introduce them a little bit here, but they will introduce themselves when they do the presentation. So this is uh, a collaboration between Janak Joshi, who has now moved on to Montana State uh, University. His own has his own lab there. Adam Huberger from Colorado State and Amy Chalkowski also from Colorado State. So uh, they will take turns presenting and are all here so you have the full expertise here to answer your questions at the end. So I'm going to turn it over now to Adam 
who will be starting the presentation. And I just wanna say that this is a chance, it's a great chance for you as the audience to interact with our authors outside the pages of the journal. So that you can still contact them outside. And this is something I wanna always point out that there is a little email link for the corresponding author and you are able to email them with your questions. So of course the webinar is uh, a great place for you to do this, but remember that's not the end. You can still continue this conversation. Okay, Adam, thanks so much. So I will go ahead and share my screen. And how does it look? All good to go? Excellent. Great. Okay. Um, so first I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to present today. Um, this is really fantastic, especially with such an international group um, to be able to speak towards people from all over the world um, about this project that we are all extremely excited about. Um, so to introduce myself, I'm Adam Huberger. I'm faculty at the Department of Horticulture, Colorado State University. Uh, my research background is mostly focused in plant metabolomics that spans both plant health, which I'll talk about today, um, and also in human health. Um, and so while well, this project in here, this presentation is mostly on potato, um, a lot of this work actually expands to different plants. I study a lot of different crops. Basically, if it's a plant and it's made up of molecules I care about and I kind of want to know what's in it um, and how it's responsible for different traits, phenotypes, and interactions with different microbes. Um, and then the co-author um, who did much of the work that we'll present today is Dr. Janak Joshi. Janak, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Uh, my name is Janak Joshi. I'm faculty at Montana State University. I study plant microbe interaction and plant disease management. And I aim to integrate molecular and high throughput multiomics tool in plant pathology research. Great, thanks, Janak. Um, so Janak will be presenting the back half of this presentation. So I'll start out um, and get us going. So uh, I always like to begin right here, uh, which is to start and think about and always reflect on why we're doing what we're doing um, and the science that we focus on. And so I love just constantly revisiting this definition of what is food security from the FAO um, and just read it, which is food security exists when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious foods that meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. Um, and so I think a lot of us here understand this um, and really what it means uh, is the relevance of this type of work and what MPMI focuses on in terms of the science being published is that having healthy plants is really critical to global food security. Um, and so creating healthy plants, understanding what makes a healthy plant, um, as well as the interaction of plants with the microorganisms that exist all around them um, is really essential to making sure that we have adequate and sufficient nutritious foods uh, throughout the world. So the, um, the particular microbe in the pathogen system that we're working with is soft rot, and black leg. Um, and these particular plant diseases, they typically emerge as epidemics. Uh, it's mostly caused by pectobacterium and decay of bacterial species. Um, and this affects food crops. You know, we, as we saw, we're going to be talking about potato um, and also about ornamentals as well. Um, and so here's some nasty pictures of a disease um, just to show the importance of these things. Um, it affects especially kind of fleshy organs, specifically of soft rot, so things like onion and potato. Um, it will also affect um, fleshy organs of ornamentals as well. Um, and when this disease manifests in the stem, essentially it's like stem rots. So you have disease such as black leg and potato. Uh, so these bacteria can infect in many different ways. Um, and then the common theme though, is that it essentially melts the plants to, to mush um, when they interact with these microbes. So the way that this disease works um, is that these are kind of sneaky pathogens that wait until conditions are just right um, and then boom, your mush in like 24 hours. Uh, and so these things kind of hang around and then they essentially have these virulence factors. So one being quorum sensing. So they want to make sure a quorum is present before they become pathogenic. Um, they also need to be motiles. They need to be able to move. Um, and then sometimes biofilms are involved as well. And so when all these three, two to three things are just right, then they make the decision to cause disease. Um, and this is going to be a common theme uh, that we'll talk about in terms of trying to understand what resistance to this disease is actually um, focusing on. So in addition to virulence factors, there are clear pathogenicity factors in terms of what manifests into the symptoms of the disease. 
Um, and the main ones from this pathogen are secreting plant cell wall degrading enzymes, um, specifically pectate lyases and cellulases, as well as exoproteases. And I highlight that one specifically is because as you saw with the title, we're gonna kind of move into protease inhibitors as a mechanism of, mechanism of defense. Um, there are toxins and effectors also involved with pathogen pathogenicity, um, but this is gonna be our primary focus right here is really the interaction with this bacteria with the ability to degrade the plant cell wall um, to be able to have disease start to form. Um, and so I like to describe this method of causing disease in virulence and pathogenesis as stand down, we're all there, and then let's burn the house down and wreak havoc. And this is a little bit opposite from the way a lot of other pathogens function that may try to coexist with the host um, or just for a longer period of time. Um, so this one though is, is absolutely destroy everything in front, which is why we have um, disease systems or symptoms that look like this. So um, you can't give a talk about plant microbe interactions in terms of plant health without showing a disease triangle. And so um, here it is for this particular uh, um, plant disease. And so the way that this disease is managed, there are kind of environmental and agronomic uh, aspects at which we can start to manage these things. So understanding how things like temperature, humidity, sanitation, soil type, all of that plays into this disease as well. Um, but then there are aspects of tackling this disease of focusing on the pathogen, which is getting really deep in terms of how this pathogen actually causes disease. What is its life cycle? What is it looking to do? What are the microenvironments that are necessary for this to cause disease? What are its components of pathogenesis and virulence? How does it evade resistance if, if that mechanism is possible? Um, and then from the host side is what is the plant doing to actually resist this disease? Um, so is there regulation of plant, the plant immunity? Um, what aspects of plant morphology and physiology are involved with the formation of the disease? Um, is there pathogen recognition happening? Um, and then are there, is this a phytoalexin or a phytoantocytin system? Um, and this is another thing that we'll talk about throughout this talk. And really where we're focused on with tackling this disease is this interaction between the plant and microbe. So the system we're working with is potato. Um, we care about potato because it is the, it's the fourth most produced um, crop in the world. It's the primary produced and consumed vegetable around the world. Um, and unfortunately, there is no resistance in any cultivated potato. So in Solanum tuberosum cultivated potato, no resistance has been identified um, in any of our cultivated lines. And so what that means is that this is what happens when you inoculate this plant um, with, these with these bacteria, they quickly start, the tissues start to rot away um, and the plant will fall over. Um, however, um, there has been resistance identified in wild potatoes. And one that we're looking at in particular is Solanum chacoense. Uh, this is a wild potato that's being studied for resistance to many different diseases. There's resistance to viruses and nematodes and fungi. And so it, in general, it's just a very hardy plant, um, which again, my perspective as a plant chemist is to say, well, what is the chemical makeup of that? What's the reason for that? Um, so we know that resistance exists and it's been identified in wild potatoes, doesn't exist in cultivated potatoes, um, which makes us kind of ask these fundamental questions of what is this wild potato doing? How is it able to resist this plant? Um, so the first things that we're starting to ask um, with respect to this wild potato is what strategy is it using? Um, is it killing the bacteria? That's something very simple. Is it making a toxin that's killing microbes? Is it stalling the bacteria? So is there a bacteriostatic mechanism? Is it inhibiting pathogenicity factors? Um, and is this resistance basal or induced? Does it, is it there or is it recognizing a pathogen that's present and then mounting a defense system to be able to fight off that pathogen? And then once we're able to think about and identify the strategy that it's using to survive, um, how is it doing this? And so we wanna know exactly what molecules are acting on the bacteria. Are these preformed or induced? That gets to this basal, or, or is this resistance basal or induced? Is this an active response um, where it's recognizing maps? Um, and then ultimately what genes control these molecules? Because as we are starting to cross these two and incorporate um, different genetics into cultivated potato, um, we wanna know what genes are responsible for this. What is the mechanism? So again, defining myself as a plant chemist, I always wanna know what's in the potato that is actually interacting with microbes. So a chemical view of this plant microbe interaction. 
and that when the two organisms start to meet, this occurs in a microenvironment with thousands of plant molecules. So think about what's in a potato. Um, the most simplest reason that we have this pathogen infecting um, these plant tissues is because they are rich in carbohydrates, which is the ideal source of food for microbes. And so we, when thinking about potatoes, it consists of small saccharides, so glucose and fructose and sucrose, there's oligo and polysaccharides, there's fibers that make up the plant cell walls. And so these don't really exist necessarily as defense mechanisms in terms of molecules, but this is what's there for food. At the same time, the microbe is interacting with a whole series of metabolites. Um, and so this would be things like organic acids, amines, amino acids, alkaloids, and peptides, um, which the microbes are able to use as food, but generally sequentially after these have all used up, then they can kind of shift gears and begin to consume these and grow on these types of things. Um, but really at a fundamental level, they begin as also components of defense. And there's been a lot of really nice um, research and I'll explain some in some preliminary slides as we move into the paper, explaining that there is a contribution of metabolites to this whole plant microbe interaction. Um, and then thinking about defense aspects, there are also proteins. These are macromolecules that exist in potato as well. Um, we don't really think of potatoes so much as a high protein type food, um, but these proteins are there and they do have a role in this particular interaction. Um, the composition of proteins in um, potato, and this is gonna be tuber, this is also in stems and leaves. Um, it's typically usually about 50% storage protein, especially in the tubers, um, primarily potatin. There's also a set of proteins called protease inhibitors. Um, and this is the main theme that we'll get into in this talk. And then other enzymes as well. So with metabolic functions such as starch synthase synthases and lipoxin. Um, and other kinases and things like that. Um, and so what we wanna really know is how is all this at play in the interaction between these two organisms? So actually the first part of the story begins with looking at the metabolite composition, which is the, a mix of the carbohydrates and metabolites and looking at this and how it affects the interaction between the host and the pathogen. Um, and so this is a precursor to the publication um, that we're primarily presenting today, um, but it's an important part of the story, so that's why I do want to present it. And so one of the first observations, and this is really, this is um, Dr. Joshi's work, was that when you, in, when you inoculate Solanum chocolincy, the wild potato with this bacteria, the plant seems to just grow out of it. It just kind of continues growing as if nothing was there. And then when you actually start to look inside and see what's going on is that you're able to see that even so M6 here is gonna be our wild potato, which is resistant. If you start to compare a susceptible cultivated potato or a susceptible tuberosum versus a wild chocolate um, you can see that the bacteria are still there. Um, they're just not really penetrating as much. They're more in the apoplastic spaces. There's a little bit of penetration, but in general, it looks like these bacteria are alive and well. They're just not infecting and penetrating the plant cells, which is why from what we're able to see in terms of what we define as resistance is actually more like tolerance where this plant is able to tolerate these bacteria there and just kind of keep growing. Um, we then started to look in terms of chemical composition and say, well, let's take a metabolite extract of this plant stem, um, isolate all of those sugars and all those metabolites, the organic acids, the amino acids and amines, um, and then add those back to bacterial cultures and just see, do these things start to kill microbes or do they stall them? Um, and what we found was that these microbes are able to grow just fine. Um, they're able to use this as a source of food and grow. And in fact, what we saw when we look at growth curves um, just in vitro, we're able to see that they were actually growing better in the resistant wild metabolite composition or um, material than they were with the um, susceptible uh, tuberosum. Um, so this actually shows that basically taco NC as a wild potato in terms of a strategy, uh, it's not using, it's not killing the bacteria or stalling them. They're growing just fine, which is leading us to our next theory about strategy, which is, is it inhibiting pathogenicity factors? And specifically, are there metabolites in there or molecules that are targeting virulence pathways? Um, and then also, is this resistance basal or induced? Um, I'll just tell you right now, so as getting into this, we're really focused, we started with basal, and what this means is, do you have to inoculate and then extract metabolites or just extract metabolites at the start from any old tissue? Um, and we never moved to really testing induced because we were able to see that resistance is indeed basal. Um, so I'll just kind of specify that at this point in the talk. So what we started doing was we extracted metabolites. 
Um, we added them to cultures of these different pathogens and then looked for um, basically quantifying different virulence traits. And so the first thing, as we mentioned, you know, these pathogens need to secrete plant cell wall degraded enzymes or they're not able to um, induce disease. And so what we saw was that all these um, secreted enzymes, so proteases, pectate lysis, and cellulases, and the metabolites that were extracted from the resistant wild potato, we saw significantly less activity of all of these different enzymes. So that was kind of one mechanism of resistance is there are metabolites in there that are inhibiting the activity of these plant cell wall degrading enzymes. The other thing that we saw was an inhibition in quorum sensing. Um, and so this is data showing that again, from the resistant M6 compared to the susceptible DM1, we were able to see significant decrease in overall quorum sensing activity in the system. Um, so our conclusion from this is getting at the strategy is that this wild potato seems to be targeting virulence mechanisms in these pathogens, which is yes, the pathogen is there. We're not trying to kill it. We're just trying to stop it from forming, um, from becoming pathogenic. Which leads us to the beginning of what this paper that we're here to present is about, um, which is at the same time that we're evaluating carbohydrates and metabolites, we're also investigating protein. Um, and so this actually, there's a chemical reason for this is that typically when you're doing a metabolite extractin, extraction, you are precipitating protein. So you're usually either extracting one or the other. And so what this basically means is you, you do an extraction and then you essentially have two components of chemistry that you can evaluate at the same time. And so we had really good, interesting results coming from this. And at the same time, we were getting to be able to investigate the protein composition. Um, and so this is where I will switch over to Dr. Joshi, who will begin to introduce um, the, the rationale for getting at proteins and kind of talk through that story, which is this particular paper. Um, so uh, Dr. Joshi, I'll switch over to you. Okay. <clears throat> so I believe everyone can hear me well. So the next set of molecules, uh, macromolecules that potato have are proteins, which are basically, we can categorize into three different groups. Storage proteins, as Adam already mentioned, most of them are patatins, and then protease inhibitors. There are multiple families associated with this group of proteins. We have mentioned here five, so there are definitely more than that. And so there are enzymes. So these, since these macromolecules were involved in defense, we tried to, uh, Adam, can we go to the next slide? Uh, so these uh, macromolecules or proteins, we, pure, we extracted them and then we profiled how does it look? What are the proteins that are in M6 versus DM1, which, is, which are our resistant and susceptible? And we identified 778. Yeah, definitely it's low, but this is the first indication that protease inhibitor might be the one that are there. Next thing, the way we extracted, we tried to do size exclusion, uh, to make our extract more simple and also uh, I mean, um, ammonium sulfate precipitation. So we knocked out uh, the less soluble ones and focused on the high soluble ones. And the picture on the right hand side is the volcano plot that was generated using uh, proteins and peptides that were obtained in the proteomic profile. So in this picture, independent of size, shape, color, uh, each dot circle or rhombus is a protein or protease inhibitor that was detected in the proteomic profile. And I will get back this, uh, to this picture again. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, so this protein extract that we had, uh, except doing protein profile, we also tested uh, the uh, effect that would cause in the bacteria. So the first thing that we tested was its effect on bacterial multiplication. Uh, so protein extract, when we added it to bacterial culture, when we grew bacteria into it, there was no significant difference in growth. So they grew equally in buffer DM1 or M6, which are our resistant and susceptible potato. So our next question is, what is their effect on bacterial virulence? So in this picture, the first column of the picture are the motility plates, means they have the medium to support bacterial swimming motility. And Pactobacterium uses its flagella to find the host, colonize, and invade into the host. So this is an important virulence determinant of Pactobacterium. And in this plate, if we see the turbid region, uh, means it's because of the bacteria. So in buffer and DM1, we see the turbid region. It means bacteria are all over there on the plate. 
Whereas when the, we had bacteria mixed with M6 protein extracts, bacteria is kind of stalled in the center of the plate, means it's lost its motility. And our next picture, next column of the picture, the protease plates. So these are the plates with agar and milk proteins and the bacterial proteases or bacterial supernatant can break down milk proteins. So in this plate, we made a hole, put supernatant into it and see how they, what is their activity. So bigger the halos means higher the activity. So this in the first picture here is the mixture of the buffer and the supernatant. We saw significant clearing or the halo area means significant protease activities. Whereas in DM1, we also see the clearing DM1 plus supernatant. And when we mixed M6 protein extract with supernatant, we almost lost the protease activity. So this tells M6 protein extracts significantly have a negative impact on protease activity, which are essential for bacteria to melt down the plant cell membrane. And another interesting phenomena that we saw was on bacterial cell morphology. So in buffer and DM1 extract, this is how the typical pectobacterium cells look like, rod shape, three to four micrometers in size. And in presence of buffer and DM1, this is how they look like, typical in their natural state. Whereas when we mixed M6 with protein extract, M6 protein extract with bacteria, bacteria tend to elongate at least two to three micrometers in size. And even uh, in some of the experiments, we saw significantly bigger length, but the continuous trend that we saw was in whenever bacteria are exposed to M6 protein extract, they tend to elongate. And in literature, it has been, uh, they have been connected. So this morphology and this bacterial behavior has been connected with avirulent phase. So when bacteria are elongated, they are avirulent and they are less motile. This is how it has been connected with the bacterial virulence. And we try to study uh, the proteomics or how the bacterial behavior would look like at the level of transcriptome or proteome. So we took this bacteria from DM1 extract, from M6 extract, and did proteomic study. Next slide. So this is the bacterial proteome. So we saw significant differentiation of uh, bacterial proteins. And of those, we were focused mostly on virulence uh, genes and with some of the transcript, uh, the, at the level of transcripts, the, the virulence gene related to motility, chemotaxis, or some of the transporters, they were significantly reduced in presence of M6 protein extracts. So uh, coming back to the next slide. Uh, so you were familiar with this. So this is the picture that I showed you before where we did a proteomic profiling of uh, M6 pro protein extract versus DM1 protein extracts. So as I told you, independent of color, shape, and size, every uh, one of these is a proteins and peptides. So what is the difference between M6 potato proteins and DM1 potato proteins? So what is the significant difference? What could weigh more on the type of response that we saw in bacteria? So the protein, as I mentioned before, you may remember there are three groups. So storage proteins, protease inhibitors, and the enzymatic proteins. So the, the group of proteins, especially protease inhibitor, could be the one that could contribute to the type of phenotype that we saw in bacteria. So that could be the only group of protein that has potential for such effects on bacteria. Next slide. So protease inhibitors were our primary candidates. So those are the ones that are in uh, pink rhombus in the volcano plot uh, that you can see in the top right corner. So those, they have, uh, so the protease inhibitors, they were significantly higher in M6 and some of them were really unique and they have higher abundance. So we picked protease inhibitor for further studies. Uh, so this is uh, the panel here is the, pro uh, the 3D uh, um, model of the protease inhibitors from Solanum tuberosum, which is a cultivated potato, Chakwensi, our wild resistance, and even tomato, Solanum lycopersicum. So the hashtag here are the binding sites with the protease. So what we wanted to show here is uh, the protease inhibitor has multiple binding sites for protease. So this is the site where protease will bind and it will stop or inhibit their activities. In Solanum tuberosum, they tend to stay very close. So this is just the preliminary uh, studies, they, the binding site tends to stay very close though, so that might contribute towards, um, you know, messing up with the binding sites, whereas in other chakwensi or lipopersicum, they tend to spread along, they, they, are, they are apart. So the 
interference in inhibiting, uh, there are less chances of uh, inhibitions. So next slide. So what we did next was we tried to do, study more of genetics of protease inhibitors. So the first thing that we did is looked into the genome of uh, DM1 or M6, our resistant and susceptible potatoes, and try to see how they are distributed or how they are, what is their uh, numbers. So in M6 resistant potatoes, we have 127, whereas in DM1 or our susceptible potato, we had only 61 protease inhibitors. So it's like resistant uh, solanum chakwensi had more than double uh, the protease inhibitor than tuberosum had. So this actually reflects what we observed in our proteomic profile where 48 of them were expressed in M6 or our resistant one, whereas we had 32 only in the susceptible ones. And now we try to map them how and where they are located in the potato genome. So the picture on the left-hand side, the, the individual bars that are in golden color are from DM1, our susceptible, and another on cyan. Uh, the, with the mixture of blue and green, the cyan color, it represents our resistant potato. So in, when we see both of them together and when we uh, map these genes, it seems like in DM1, susceptible one, they are mostly localized in, at a specific place in chromosome 3. And whereas in M6, they are distributed all over, at least in four or five chromosomes. And even when we see the quanti uh, quantity wise, num the number of protease inhibitor wise, there are significantly higher number of protease inhibitor that we saw in our proteomic profile. So we can see that even in the left vector as well as on the right picture. So DM1, less number of protease inhibitor, M6, more number of protease inhibitor, and there was significant difference even on the abundance of those protease inhibitors. And the, another uh, study that we did was on domain analysis. So DM1 already had low number of protease inhibitors and low abundance. And on top of that, many of them are missing the signal peptides. So at least six of them in our list here, they are missing the signal peptides. Whereas in M6, only three of them are missing signal peptide, all of them have signal peptide. So uh, it's the mixture of uh, uh, quantity, uh, mixture of abundance, and also having or not having those signal peptides. So these are the type of differences that we observed when we went to the gene level or the, at the sequence level. So what we did next was we selected protease inhibitors for, as a candidate studies. So we tried to be as inclusive as possible. So I picked uh, the protein sequences, gene sequences from different location in the chromosomes, uh, different uh, chromosomes marked by star in here, different families, and the different level of abundance or their different from the quantitative data that we had the, from the proteomic analysis. Next slide. So I cloned all those genes into the E. coli system, purified the proteins, and then added it with the bacteria again, and then did a virulence assays. So the first one that we did was exoprotease, again, the protease activity, significant reduction in the, of the protease activity, and various level of uh, reductions from different specific protease inhibitor extracts. And then the next important thing we did was mix it with the bacteria and then provided with, with the favorite host of this pathogen potato. So empty vector, we saw significant uh, rotting of the tissues and we saw various level of tissue rot when we mixed with different protein extracts, individual protease inhibitor extracts. And the most interesting and striking one was 6G6571. So we have significant level of disease reduction. And in some cases, we didn't even see the level of disease. So the one of the example that we showed here in the picture, 6571, there's no disease at all. So this was really interesting for us. And we tried to incorporate this through different system. Can we go into the next slide? So we tried to incorporate it into the different system, either by spraying or overexpressing it into the plant. So the take home or the summary of what we are presenting today is in solanum tuberosum, the resistant do not exist as Adam told before, but resistant has been identified in the wild potato solanum chakwensi. So the, now the interesting thing would be to know what solanum chakwensi does so that it becomes resistant or so the disease does not appear. So uh, it does not appear. So as uh, you have seen before, bacteria survives there, but they are not able to cause disease, which means plant does something that inhibits its virulence. So it means it's just uh, follow, it just keeps up the hypothesis, just keeps growing and doesn't bother the killing the bacteria as well. And how it does it, 
is the mixture of the micro and macro molecules that the potato synthesizes. So the metabolites or the protease inhibitors that are dedicated to reduce bacterial virulence without killing it. Next slide. So with this, uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, plant proteins which have huge potential to develop uh, to study the mechanism of the virulence, to identify the weaknesses and control the bacteria, bacterial plant bacterial disease, and has huge potential developing as an anti antivirulence sprays. And as I mentioned before, it has been known to be acting against insect and fungi, very less on other uh, pathogens. We saw it against bacteria, and theoretically, it should really work with nematodes and viruses as well. So there is a huge potential uh, to use against management of other plant diseases. And on top of it, it has a, a role in gut health and human nutrition as well. And with this, I would like to acknowledge, next slide please, uh, acknowledge Amy Tcharkovsky, which is a, professor, is a professor at Colorado State University. So this was a joint project with Amy Tcharkovsky and Adam Huberger. So funding agencies, USDA. And yeah, not to forget Kitty Brown. She helped us with the proteomic profiling of uh, our potatoes and we are open to questions and also yeah thank you thanks, thank you for providing Adam. the platform i would like to thank to pro mpmi for providing the platform to share our research at the international level thank you janak and adam for a really excellent seminar very interesting and we have also have amy charkowski with us today so we have um a pretty good panel, almost everybody from the paper uh, sharing their expertise, ready to answer your questions. So if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A and I will start with them there. We won't be able to um, allow people to speak. So it'll just be through the Q&A. So um, why don't you stop sharing your screen so, we, so everybody can see um, the others. Okay. So um, the first question is a very general one from Zahur Mir. My question is about the role of protease inhibitors in modulating the jasmonic acid pathway. So I think looking not so much the effect on the bacterium, but um, is there an effect on the plant itself? Um, I don't believe that there would be a significant effect because these things are just produced basally. So they are. Um, they do have a role in overall metabolism. So I guess you would see minor fluctuations throughout the development of the plant and potentially if it's being infected, maybe there is an upregulation of these. Um, but in general, especially thinking about potatoes, their stems, their leaves, their, the tubers, which is modified stem, um, they're producing these things all the time. Um, and then they're either being stored in the vacuole or in these cases, they're typically being just pushed into the apoplast they're in the xylem, so they're just kind of being moved around. So I, I wouldn't necessarily think it would be directly related to jasmonic acid type pathway, um, where you have like an active response, um, but I could see it happening. Um, that's something that we haven't looked at was that the change in this whole system when things are induced and being infected, because we saw such potent effects just at the basal level, and that's really what's in line with the type of resistance we're seeing in Chaco -Enzi. Thank you. So Siva Sankari asks, does the elongated bacteria have any change in copy number of their genome or does each have one genome and the cell just gets bigger? And that's something I was also wondering because that's something that happens in rhizobium during that plant microbe interaction. They get longer and longer and they do a lot of endoreduplication of their genome. So uh, I don't know, have you had a chance to look at that in the pectobacterium? Jack, do you want to jump in on that or Amy? We we haven't had a chance to look at it. We um, we have way 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 more questions than than answers right now about this. Yes, I'm sure. It's just that's sort of one of the characteristics of rhizobia. Once it infects, it starts becoming longer, and and it's all because of little peptides that the plant is secreting at them, not proteases, but still. Anyway, so interesting question. Thank you, Siva. Alexander McClelland asks, how specific are these protease inhibitors to PCWDEs? And do they inhibit other endogenous proteases? Uh, 
So the protease inhibitor, we tested on other plant cell wall degrading enzymes as well. So pectid lyase, protease, cellulase. So they tend to affect on others as well. So it's not specific to protease. And we tested uh, the exogenous protease. So these protein molecules are big enough to not get inside the bacterial cells. So what we tested and what we are presenting is the exogenous protease activities, not endogenous. Uh, so, but well, this bacteria again, uh, depends, uh, if, like the virulence is determined by the number of cells. So again, quorum sensing comes into play in the later stage. So then that might have an effect on endogenous transcript level of protease. But the results that we are presenting, uh, we are thinking it's exogenous. It might have after effect as an endogenous and it's not specific to one protease. It's, it has shown effect to multiple plant cell wall degrading enzymes. Uh, which are pectin lyase, protein, and cellulase. Those three are the ones that I tested. Just on the broad spec oh, go ahead, Amy. Just to, to clarify, was it the extract you tested or the purified protease inhibitors? It was the extract, right? It was the extract. Okay, so there might be other, we, right. We, we think there's a lot going on yet to look at here. So a number of <clears throat> ones being, ex but <clears throat> yeah, that's the, the idea of, of course, there will be some feedback back into the bacteria, but um, so much happening with just preventing cell wall de degradation. Very exciting that you have such a range of activities and inhibition in there. Um, okay, Ian Toth asks, do you know if the different um, protease inhibitors have a different effect on protease motility and virulence of different Pectobacterium and Dickia species? And I don't know if you've pursued that farther yet? We have tested it in multiple pecto species and DK as well. So if it's effective against pecto, it is effective. Uh, it works on all species and DK as well, but not all the pecto behave or shows the similar kind of effect. Suppose one of the PI in our case, suppose G1 is effective against uh, by, it reduces by 50%. There might be another protease inhibitor, suppose G6, it reduces by 80%. So the mm -hmm. response is different, but it usually stays consistent across genus and species. But we have not tested on a lot of collections. So the, the species or the genuses that we have, five or seven of them, it's consistent uh, across the species, but not all PI act the same. PI, I mean protease inhibitors. Really interesting. I mean, the fact that this is so um, broad ranging, I think can have a lot of really exciting implications. Uh, as you're pointing out, you know, who knows how many, um, there's only so many ways to break down cellul cellulase. So there's going to be cellulose, there's going to be conservation and you're going to be able to get in there and, and nip at those enzymes. These are conserved. So, okay. Um, Emilia Lopez, Lopez Solania says, nice talk, thank you. Have you analyzed if the bacteria um, treated with protease inhibitors are flagellated bacteria? Uh, so what? we never went to the that microscopic level of looking at how the flagella looks like, uh, but at the transcript level, we saw a significant reduction of the flagellate genes that contributes to that flagella. Thank you. Um, Brian Kvitko asks, do you have a hypothesis for how the SP lacking protease inhibitors get secreted? So signal peptide lacking protease inhibitors get secreted to interact with the bacteria or if they do? No, we have not done, we have not reached that far. So we are thinking of it. This is where we did domain analysis and we tried to pick some of the candidates. So yeah, uh, I believe you need to wait a few more months or years to get the answer, so. But you were able, these were from, um, you did detect them extracellularly, right? So they are being secreted. It's just a question of, how? Um, okay, Okan Unong asks, is there any link between salicylic acid and protease inhibitors in the basal resistance observed in the wild type potato? Um, I think you haven't really gone backwards to see how these, these protease inhibitors are 
stimulated, produced, transcriptionally activated or anything. So that's, no. yeah, going back in the potato, that's gonna be a really interesting direction. Okay, Valder Junio Vaz Moreira asks, I would like to know if you have any idea about the mechanism of action of these inhibitors. Can you tell me if these inhibitors have a preferential binding site with these proteases or interact in any other allosteric site or active site? Good question. This is where we are headed. So <laughs> since we have the sequences, this is where we are going uh, into doing structural uh, studies, binding assays, see how much uh, potent they are. Um, maybe I think we even can get the answer of how many proteas a single protease inhibitor can bind to. So yeah, this is the direction we are headed to, but at this point of the time, we don't have answers. And this is the reason I picked that paper. So many exciting directions to go from here. This is just the beginning. This is the, the you know, the starting point. Um, so yeah. So many interesting things. And I know some of those uh, you know, modeling tools are gonna be very, uh, very interested. So um, Renata Lebecca says they swim. And John Bennett says, I'm not familiar with the infection process. Does the pathogen both infect and lead to mush within 24 hours? Or does the pathogen have to colonize over a longer period of time? And then once quorum sensing is triggered, the bacteria lead to the mush symptom. And thank you all, great talk. Yeah, um, I, I can take that one. So um, infection with Pectobacterium can be really, really unpredictable. So you can, out in, in nature, you can test it or detect it. We can know that it's in a crop of potato, for example, and, and maybe nothing will happen. Um, and under natural conditions, it's also very complicated because it's very rarely just one strain or one species present. Um, in the lab, we can um, inoculate and um, get severe symptoms within a day or two. Um, you know, if we adjust the, depending on the plant species and the conditions we use, the strain we use, um, we can also adjust things in the lab so that we don't get severe disease. It just, um, uh, yeah, so it's it's uh, not a simple answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> so. But it's a it's a good question, um, and and I think Amy's point that in nature there's going to be many bacteria, many different kinds of microbes interacting with the plant all at the same time, and so really a good success would be having a pretty general approach. Okay, Alexandra Tromas asks, are you already spraying the protease inhibitors directly on infected plants? The question we all want to know. The answer is no. Janath yeah, went and got himself a faculty position. Yeah, so that was the point. <laughs> I switched it. between the universities and yeah, yeah, that's definitely in the radar then. That's the first thing I will do once I once my lab is already set up. Yes, yeah, so you can notice the empty office behind him. That would be uh, Janak at his new position. So congratulations to, to Janak for his new lab at, at Montana State. And I'm sure that's one of the first things you will be checking. I see some, some applause coming up from the audience. Um, Babesh Bor Borfukan says, nice talk. Are you only looking for protease inhibitors or do you find any receptor molecules in susceptible lines? No, I don't believe that the, the extraction process um, would be isolating specific receptors, especially when we look at the proteomic data, we didn't really see anything like that. Um, and then just knowing that protease inhibitors are a class of antimicrobial compounds that exist in these tissues, um, that's why we mostly focused on those. Um, and that's what Dr. Joshi then cloned in T. coli and purified and tested specifically. Um, but th there could be receptors, some kind of recognition at play as well. Um, but that's, I don't think that's going to be the, even the first line of defense, which is really what we're focused on. Right. And I think, um, yeah, preventing those little fragments of cell walls from getting away is also going to uh, impact the plant response and presumably the bacterial response. 
So, and I, and we're also, I just want to say in the chat, we're getting lots of nice comments to everybody, thanking you for a great presentation, really interesting. Um, remember to put your questions in the Q&A box, um, but you can always compliment the, the authors in, in the chat. Um, okay, so Ashley Holmes asks, do the protease inhibitors have a function in potato other than defense responses, such as in plant development? They do, um, but primarily less so. Um, so they could have specific functions throughout development, but in general, most of these are there to exist as defense compounds. It, it makes sense. Related yes. to that, the wild species has many that were not present in the domesticated, domesticated line that we looked at. And so um, it seems it's possible to breed them out. Um, yeah. Yeah, that many that we're looking at would not have that core function. Um, and then we have an anonymous question here. Are these protease inhibitors potato specific? Uh, remember, oh, oh, I see. I don't think the question is, could they only be applied to potatoes, but are they only made by potatoes? That's what I think that's asking. No, they're made by all plants. Um, and so they're a component of protein in all plant species. In potatoes, they're just known to be, they're relatively high for the protein pool, um, especially in something like potato tuber. When you talk about total protein, um, there's no need for photosynthetic metabolic enzymes. And so more of the protein pool tends to be these protease inhibitors, whereas you can still see it in all plants and leaves and stems and everything like that, but the proportion is gonna be much, much lower. Um, so I think that's why even when we did initial comparisons of stems and tubers, we found tubers to be, have a more potent effect in terms of the extract of them because they're so enriched for these things. Yes, um, it's interesting that you, you have so many there. Okay, um, Lindsay Dutrois says, thank you for a very interesting presentation. And Claudia Martinez um, also is wondering whether these protease inhibitors protect against nematodes. So just thinking very broad spectrum here because there will also be secreted proteases, et cetera. I, I, don't, I don't think you've gone that direction yet, but I'll let you speculate. Yeah. Uh, so we have not tested it, but uh, from the literatures, we know nematodes to multiply need serine proteases for multiplication. And our protease inhibitor pool has a specific serine protease inhibitors. So we have not tested, but theoretically we believe it should protect. But yeah, the important question, the million dollar question would be, what is that specific protease inhibitor? That is specific serine protease inhibitor. And I think there are multiple. So yeah, the overall extract should show the potential, but yeah, still we need to clean up finding out what is that specific serine protease inhibitor that would be effective. Right, so I, I like this story that, that is coming out even more in the Q&A, the, the idea that these protease inhibitors are made by all plants, but made at very high levels in this wild potato, at which gave these collaborators a chance to find it, right? If it were not in such a high level, you probably wouldn't have been able to see it just with a culture, with an extract. Um, having an effect and that it may be a, a widespread kind of basal defense and maybe something. I love that you could, um, you don't have to even breed it in, right? It's already there. It's already extracted. You have it in a tube, you can use it. And that's really the power of it. You don't have to make it uh, to go through the long breeding process or make a transgenic potato. You pre presumably have this protease mixture present in a tube. Um, so, that's the exciting thing. Okay, a couple more questions. Alexander McClellan says, um, perhaps a bit naive, but might these protease inhibitors act against human digestive enzymes? And maybe that could account for them being bred out. Ooh, that's an interesting idea. What do you think? That's not naive. That's an excellent question because it's on point. Um, it, the, so these protease inhibitors in foods are considered anti-nutrients because they inhibit human gut proteases. Um, there's even, you can even feed these to people and still see protease inhibitor activity that's maintained throughout the feces. Sorry to go there, but just to talk through the impact of these things, um, they're potent and they're effective. They're resistant to digestion, they're resistant to heat, 
Um, so that's why they're such wonderful molecules as plant defense. Um, that being said, so in situations where you need as many calories from your food as possible, it's an anti-nutrient. In a situation where you are over consuming calories and looking for a way to diet, that's a good thing. Um, and so that's why these protease inhibitors are often marketed as dietary aids and supplements to be able to reduce your caloric intake um, alongside with your diet. So that's more of a nutraceutical application of these as well. Um, and that's from tuberosum. So that's not nothing with wild potato, although it'd be fun if you get an amazing, the magic diet pill from this wild potato as well. I had not thought about that. I imagine yeah. it would throw off your gut microbiome quite a bit since that's, they're using those proteases for all sorts of things in there. Mm -hmm. um, really interesting though, to think of them as an anti-food. There, there's um, multiple reasons not to eat wild potatoes. So don't, mm -hmm. don't anyone go out and try that. Yeah, with all those protease inhibitors, I can see why. And I, you didn't even get to the other metabolites. Okay. Um, Helen Tai asks, are there protease inhibitors that are specific to prokaryotes and eukaryotes? What do you think? Um, I, I think that it would make sense for there to be differences, um, especially if these are acting externally on these microbes. Um, so it would make sense that perhaps there is a pool um, of these 120 something genes. Um, some can be more targeted for some types of microbes and um, some of these proteins could be for others. Um, so given that this is a broad system, um, it makes sense that some would be fine tuned for different species. Right, and there's, that's a complex mixture. And I think Jonak is going to have a very busy next 10 years. Um, okay, so we have a question from Guisha Hao, who asks, I'm wondering why these um, protease inhibitor genes are highly expressed in the wild potato. Uh, are they induced? Like, could they be induced more? I, I don't know. You probably always extracted from not infected. Yeah, could so they be induced we did more? activity assays, even after inducing, there was no difference. Uh, so we had some prelim data telling that they are not induced, they are innate. So that I believe that answers that one of the question. But why they are expressed in wild type? Because they are in wild. They have more challenges than the domesticated ones. And while domesticating, breeding, maybe those of genes were left out because at the point of time when people were breeding, maybe hundreds of years ago at that time, like, you know, more calorie intake and that was more important. And now this protease inhibitor are against it. So maybe they are left out. We don't know the reason, but yeah. So in wild type, they have more challenges and while breeding, maybe since they are anti-nutrients, maybe they were left out. Good answer. Yes. Um, wild potatoes are not living in a cultivated field being fertilized and sprayed with pesticides. So very different life. And then Dennis Halterman has a very important public service announcement. Do not eat wild potato to lose weight. So um, wild potato, don't use it as a food. Um, Shrita Ranganathan says, excellent talk, thank you. Does the protease inhibitor exert any fitness cost um, on plant development? We were talking about fit, like a cost in terms of human consumption, but would there be any fitness cost to plant development? We, we um, collaborated with someone to make a transgenic plant with one of these inhibitors. Um, and we don't have, it doesn't appear to be a fitness cost with that, that single um, example. I, the protease inhibitors that Janak found are from multiple families though. So I think um, generalizing too much with, you know, the amount of data we have is a mistake because um, whatever's true for one family or even one gene is probably not true for all of them. And we've also looked at this from one line of one wild species. So um, there's just a lot to find. Um, that said that one wild, well, generally wild potato are, um, they grow very robustly. Um, so um, I, yeah. Certainly it doesn't seem to harm their growth. Yeah, I mean, the weeds, they they do 
great. And yeah, so fantastic. Yeah. Um, so I'm not, I'm going to pass on the last question, which is asking how protease inhibitors can um, act on bacteria to reduce virulence because um, you went through some of that um, talking about effects on motility and it's the fact that it's inhibiting these cell wall degrading enzymes. Um, and the, this will all be available uh, on a recording soon, hopefully by tomorrow, um, so that you can watch all the bits that you missed. Um, but until then, I have a question, which is we've talked about so many different exciting directions that could come from here. What do you think are the next big um, areas, big questions um, coming out of this? And then I'm going to ask each person, maybe starting with Janak. Okay. Do you want yeah, so there are multiple avenues we are thinking of. So the first thing would be uh, we already have started uh, until some level of having transgenic plant, having this into the crop and see if they protect the crop from when we challenge them with the pathogen. Next thing would be just spraying it on top of the food and see if they protect the food. Uh, so these two are the prime directions I think I will start with. And yeah, we definitely know uh, their role in gut microbiome as well. So he, there is a huge potential in that, that direction as well, yeah. But if you would ask me to prioritize and say one, two, that one would be having the transgenic and next one would be developing it into a spray product. Thank you, all very exciting directions. Adam. Uh, mine is uh, less applied, more just big picture about the, the biology and the science at play, which is, why are there these differences between the cultivated and the wild? Um, and is that true for all cultivated and wild? And how does that translate to other plant systems as well at which we have diseases that we need to control? And is this a system because it's an anti-nutrient that has been kind of downgraded and bred out throughout thousands of years of domestication that we can then go back to um, and be able to, to fine tune and know which genes, which variants of those genes lead to durable resistance in the, in the food system. Yes, exactly. The same reason that people try to develop low lignin varieties of things, um, which certainly make them less easy to be chewed and, and more susceptible to diseases. So same kind of thing. What makes you a good crop or food plant might would make you a pretty bad wild plant and vice versa. Um, Amy, what, what do you think? What are the next big questions here? Um, I guess, first of all, just made me, I was happy about the result because uh, when I look around outside, I see plants everywhere, you know, Pectobacterium and Dickey are everywhere. There should not be plants, right? There must be something that's generally happening um, to keep them from causing disease. And, and this, this plus some um, quorum sensing inhibitors are both really good mechanisms. Um, I really just wanna know how it's working. Um, so what are the what are the specific targets, and then um, and then if and how there's is there interplay with the quorum sensing inhibitors as well? Um, so, but yeah, I I enjoyed these questions. These are things we've had during our lab meetings, and you're looking at pretty much the entire group right now. So um, we um, we have a lot more questions than we have hands right now to do the work. So go get some grants, Janak. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, very interesting questions. I was wondering whether some of those proteases are involved in like maturing other proteins that would be involved in next phase of virulence and they, that inhibiting them yeah. is also right, they blocking actually, the next. Yeah, they are. So there's at least one pectate lyse in Dickia that requires a protease to become more mm -hmm. active. Mm -hmm. So there's examples of that for sure. Um, but right. there's so much unknown right now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Lots of very cool stuff. Well, we could go on. Fascinating topic. And I can't wait to see. We, we published, I think, the last two papers, which you highlighted in, in MPMI. So I'm hoping we'll see more of the story um, coming out uh, in MPMI maybe next year. So I'd like to thank uh, Janak, Adam, and Amy for presenting this very exciting work and for publishing your work in MPMI. 
and all the participants for a wonderful set of questions and for coming and joining us. Uh, so I think that, thank you. So I believe that if you go to the recording, there will also be a link back to the paper if you want to go back and read it for yourself, find out what's going on. And I think that that may have also been posted in the chat, um, but I'm not sure. So, oh yes, link in the chat to view the paper. So remember all of the things they're talking about um, came, uh, most of those things were presented in the paper and you can go back and look at the details and read the methods. And now you know how to contact the authors if you have specific questions. So thanks all, and we will see you in September. <laughs>